It is October 17th, 2022 at 5.01 p.m. This is the HED Board of Commissioners regular meeting. All commissioners except for Lynn Gedanken are present, uh, as well as Michael Sullivan, and Beth SRA of HED, Sarah Breeze of EPSA, uh, Joe, I don't know where you're from, Joe Levitt, Joe, Myrna, and Mike are all from DeLorean, and Chris Goulet okay. is from Ampi. Great. Um, okay. Uh, I think we have a quorum, even though we only have four commissioners. So let's just go through the agenda. Are there any modifications to the agenda that anybody want to do? If not, I'm going to say it's approved. And uh, let's just go through the agenda. Uh, the first thing is the minutes. These minutes I'm looking at are from two meetings ago, right? I don't have one from 10-3. I got one from 9-19. That's the last minutes we have? That's correct. Okay. The special um, meeting I didn't have ready. Okay. Um, anybody have any comments to these meetings, to these minutes? I don't. Okay. If there's no comments, so we need a motion to accept them. So move. Second. Second. Okay, uh, minutes are approved. Now we can go right to the meeting. I think first up is uh, Breeze, Sarah. Yes, good evening. Uh, thank you all for having me. Uh, Sarah Breeze with EPSA. I think I've met most of you at least virtually once before, but it's ha I'm glad to be back. Uh, Mike asked me to join to go through the regulatory landscape that we are currently facing. And happy to answer any questions. I see uh, Mike let me know that he has shared our monthly board report. Uh, as it says there that we it's been a busy summer. It's been a busy couple months. Uh, we are monitoring several initiatives, uh, both within the state and federal funding opportunities that are coming out uh, quite frequently. One of which within the state is the Affordable Community Renewable Energy Program through the Department of Public Service. We submitted a, an initial proposal a few a couple months ago and have been fielding some questions as they go through that final selection process. Uh, we are following, of course, the low income docket as well as the disconnect uh, docket that's been open for quite some time at this point. In September, we filed comments with uh, UAMPS, a joint action agency out of Utah on the hydroelectric incentives program and are continuing to monitor that as well. Uh, like I said, the commission issued an order for the low income docket at the beginning of the month. We filed and supported a joint request to extend that. So those, dead, that, those comments are due at the end of October on October 28th. Additionally, we will be filing the 2023 tier three plan, annual plan as required on November 1st. So that's kind of the two very soon up and coming pieces that we are focusing on. Before I move on to any of the other items, any questions on those first topics? Uh, what, what are the specifics of the ACRE uh, grant request? I mean, or what, what not specifics, I mean, what, what is it for? So they are funding, it's an opportunity to create access for low income customers to renewable community energy. Essentially it's a net metering project. Uh, from what I understand, some of the other utilities who submitted proposals already have a system built. So our proposal is working on finding that site, building it, and then essentially buying down a PPA to have a reduced tail block rate for low income customers. Are these going to be individual PPAs to the uh, municipal utilities? In in some ways, yes. So the the understanding is that VEPSA will negotiate as we do with most of the programs, and then the utilities would opt in to have a certain number of that. The low income customers from all of our members would be uh, eligible once qualified to participate. Okay, so so the ownership would would be with VEPSA, and the grant money would go towards the installation of the project. And then reduced rates would be offered through a PPA to the municipal utilities. Correct. Okay, and it would be income qualified. Correct. Okay, this I mean these are these are I really like seeing these kind of uh, this kind of federal money uh, being pursued, which is going to lead to some more questions. But yep, 
Yeah, so this, uh, the acre one specifically through the state, but yes, we are also monitoring and keeping an eye on all of the other funding that's coming through. And with the passage of the Inflation Reduction Act, that may adjust how the financing happens through this project. If BEPSA is then able to receive those, those incentives, then that's an avenue that we're also exploring. Okay, but and this is a kind of a long-term program, obviously, because sure. uh, the siting and selection and studies, all of that has to yeah. be completed. And those grants take it forever. But uh, not to take up too much time, but I just, there, are, there are a few others. Is the uh, Well, you had another one on there, but uh, upgrading electric grid and ensuring reliability and resiliency. I don't know if you're aware of that one. Uh, yep. that, that's, a, that's been appropriated. And energy improvements in rural and remote areas. I, I actually mentioned this to, uh, to Mike a couple of meetings ago about getting it on the agenda, but we it was so busy that was, uh, but I just wanted to make sure this is on the radar because it's really important to try and get this kind of funding for, uh, and there's clean energy demonstration program and, and current and former mine land. And I've looked, there are a number of really good possibilities within the uh, VEBSA service area. That's great. Yeah, I'll definitely look into those more. We have we are keeping an eye on a lot of the funding opportunities. In fact, this Grid Resilience and Innovation Partnership Program GRIP, uh, one of the other joint action agencies nationally, um, was filing comments. So we and APPA. So we joined with those uh, through representation to basically ensure that joint action agencies can be considered as eligible recipients, so that that can be flowed through to the members as well. Okay. Great. Sarah, on the grid hardening, it says in here that you took private utility individual utilities should be encouraged to uh, seek funding on their own. Are you guys doing it as VEPSA? Plus, you're asking us to do it individually. So that one is through one specific section. Those are the state, uh, the state formula grants. So there's not a whole lot of money through that, but the department was preparing their proposal to send out. And then that was initially due at the end of August. And that deadline has been extended to, I believe, March of 23. Right. And what I understand, the department is still working through that. And when we say, you know, applying themselves, it's more so to identify the projects that you would want, because there was an attempt to build consensus among all the utilities to find one bucket or category of projects that the state formula grant would be suited for. But you know where we will try to find consensus and common ground, we will, but I, we wanted to ensure that the ability for individual utilities to express their own priorities would be preserved. And do you know if we can go retroactive to stuff we've already done? Or that I am not project? certain of. I'd have to look through the actual requirements again to, to confirm. Okay. It's it, this one of one of the issues. Just following up on what Mike said is that I see is that uh, having VEPSA uh, you know, submit a general application and have it try and make it fit for the utilities and make it available to the utilities in some cases could be very awkward. Uh, I, and yeah, I, we would appreciate you pointing us to uh, opportunities that would be more more suitable uh, to individual application. Absolutely. Yeah, we'll, we'll be keeping an eye on all of these. I know across the utilities, the, the other distribution utilities, I think there are a lot of concerns about how to ensure that Vermont gets a decent amount of this of these funds, all of this federal funding that's coming through and strategizing on how that will be best applied at the federal level and then you know get through to all of the utilities but yes absolutely i think it's important that each utility is able to uh, seek out that funding where where needed and where appropriate of course it's hard with a competitive grants right because it's it can be challenging if there's not the economy of scale but we certainly want to ensure that access yeah and and, and you know people on the individual ut utilities have skills to be able to you know, assist with uh, those kind of grant applications. I had a recent unsuccessful one for various reasons, but in any case, um, you know, there was a lot of money available and uh, yeah, anyway. Absolutely. Yes, I think everyone's in agreement to, to get as much funding as possible through, through these federal programs that are getting announced and, and becoming available. Any other questions on kind of the federal 
grants that are coming through. And so, so we're keeping an eye on those. As far as the dockets, um, BEPSA filed comments at the end of September in conjunction with Burlington Electric on the disconnection rules. The general consensus there was that the department supplied post changes, which did not address many, many of the concerns that had been brought up in 2020. So we've asked to have more workshops um, to go through those concerns. And there has been no update as of yet. The Low income rate, like I said, those comments will be due at the end of the month. We are exploring some joint comments where appropriate, but also filing our own for VEPSA. Uh, I don't know if you have seen it yet, but essentially the department or the commission has asked for uh, all the utilities to submit their data in a model and the low income percentages were provided by GMP in the original filing. And they've asked for comments on the methodology, the scenario, and overall the sense that we are getting across the board is that most of the utilities will be expressing the same concerns, provide the data as requested, of course, but also reiterate the concerns that have been raised in the past. Did, did a BEPSA, BEPSA uh, file any comments about the ANR's uh, request for comments about the EV regulation? BEPSA right? did, did not file any comments on that. I did attend the public hearing, but we did not file comments specifically there. Hey, any concerns about that or anything? I mean, there, there, are, always, <laughs> there are always going to be some concerns on the impact there, uh, but I, we, that was not an area that we specifically wanted to or decided to comment on at this point. See the Any other questions. You have more to tell us, Sarah. Oh, I was just gonna say the other case that was open just recently was on dam safety under the commission's purview. Dams that are under the commission's purview, working to align those rules with the um, the the agency of natural resources rules. So we will be looking into that and providing comments there as well. Is, is that? going to result, I mean, is the intention to, to relax some of the regulations or, or streamline them or, or you know? Uh, the, intent, the intention is to, there's kind of um, zigs and zags between the two sets of rules. Defense. So they're trying to uh, do what they can to make them as similar, if not the same as they can. Um, for example, the, uh, like our Woolcott facility is under the purview of the PUC and we have to give them a dam safety report every five years that's in accordance with a lot of Army Corps of Engineers standards. But if you look at the Vermont Dam Safety Program, which is part of ANR and they have jurisdiction all our non-power producing dams, the reports you get don't look at Army Corps data. They, they use a lot of different criteria so they're trying to get everybody on the same page with those. So and the jurisdiction switches if it becomes power producing? Yes. And, okay, sorry, I don't wanna take up too much time, but. No, and, and it can also, uh, the jurisdiction, if it, dis, if it is deemed to be a license required facility, then we would be under FERC jurisdiction to boot. So more to come on that one as well. <laughs> Any other questions or specific areas of concern? Sounds like we're all good. Thank you. You're Thank welcome. you, Sarah. Right on time. Good job, Sarah. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, next up is uh, DeLorean Power. An update. So, so I'll just kick us off. So the we haven't you all haven't heard from the team at uh, DeLorean in a while, but Joe and Mike and I did a little field trip around HED's territory and we looked at the Hardwick substation site, the Wolcott substation site, and uh, the area just at the south of 
the H11 project for possible locations. Uh, and I'll let Michael take it from there. What's been going on since my board last heard from you, Mike? Lots of things. Um, just going to kind of let uh, let Rory flip through some slides for you guys, but basically we've we've went back and went back to the the kind of drawing board and thought about the different sites that we looked at. Mike did kind of a site analysis to see which of them uh, had kind of fatal flaws on construction, which of them had the best interconnection potential, um, and which of them kind of offered the best overall opportunity to develop a, a battery. Uh, you know, the, the conclusion there was that, you know, putting out something out there by the solar site on Billings Road um, would be the most advantageous place to put something. Uh, so we kind of updated our sizing analysis that we had um, presented last time to better factor in the solar output there. We uh, updated the sizing analysis to factor in uh, the physical constraint that you identified on that distribution feeder uh, such that you know we would only be able to inject a capacity um, up to that amount that would be left over uh, if the solar was operating at full output um, and uh, basically started doing a little bit of a uh, site design um, single line diagram uh, and site work uh, there to, to kind of show you guys what our current thinking is uh, on the project and, and talk a little bit today about, about potential next steps. So um, with that uh, table setting, uh, Rory, do you have those materials uh, well, can available I just to pull ask up? The question, Mike. Mm -hmm. So yeah, we we that circuit is oversized and, and has capacity on it to accept the battery. My assumption in all of that was, well, if the sun is up and shining, we're not going to be needing you guys to be doing anything with the battery. Is that? A thawed, a flawed thought. That is uh, no, not a flawed thought. Most of the peak shaving activities between six p.m. and nine p.m. Uh, well after the sun goes down, we did do uh, that. Was factored into uh, the sizing analysis. Was kind of a an assessment of uh, solar output from that system, and we kind of calculated what the potential impact of any residual solar generation kind of into those evening hours might be on the peak shaving capability of the battery. So that was factored into the sizing analysis that we did. And I, it's, it's a very minimal impact. It's like 0.1 or 0.01 um, percent or something like that per megawatt of solar. Um, <laughs> But that was factored into the sizing analysis that we did and is reflected in the, the, the recommendations that we've made. Okay. Yeah, that's right. It's, it's, not, uh, it's not materially impactful. And what, what prevails is the scale economies of a larger battery rather than uh, any sort of kind of justification for going smaller for corner cases where there's less load. Yeah. So yeah, yeah so like... I guess, sorry, Rory, one, one other comment there. And I think, I guess the, the reason that Mike, you might be asking the, the question is, you know, how, how much should we take that solar output into consideration when sizing the battery? And I think we, you know, that's kind of part of the conversation here, right? Like if we're, there's really, not a good chance that we would ever be looking to dispatch the battery during full full solar output. So if that is if that is not a constraint, uh, then we could increase the project size incrementally a little bit. I mean, you basically said at at full output, um, we'd have about four point eight five megawatts left on that circuit. Um, That's our sizing analysis 
had us at a 4.99 megawatt uh, system otherwise, just to stay under the five megawatt ISO New England threshold. So maybe we can get an extra 0.14 megawatts out there um, if we want to accept some operational constraints such that we're not dispatching during full solar output. I think we'd be okay with that. And we could certainly look at that in any uh, future interconnection study here. Uh, is, as far as the interconnection goes, could you have two separate projects? So you have two separate interconnections and that would uh, keep you below the threshold? Uh, we could. Um, it looks like 4.99 is uh, a good size based on, you know, we kind of looked at total Hardwick system load. And the reason that site there at the solar farm is advantageous is because it can sort of address, you know, because of that tie between the substations, it can address the entire um, town's load. Um, so, you know, you could go incrementally larger still just based on system loading during coincident peak events, but it's not like you'd be adding a whole nother 4.99 megawatt system. Maybe it's three, two, three megawatt systems, but in that instance, you're going to get a better price if you do one 4.99 than you would a couple smaller systems just based on the cost of development, the cost of interconnection, the cost of permitting, all of that stuff. So yeah, I just we could a way to get, get around the, uh, the interconnection limitation. So who's, what's char charging this? Are you guys purchasing power? There's a PPA with Hardwick Electric and then there's- so Vance, let them, they'll get to that. Let them do their thing. Okay. Maybe Rory, you get gets kicked off <laughs> with our presentation. Uh, yeah, let me see if I can pull it up here. Post disabled participant screen sharing. So someone's got to. Oh, I got to. Hang on, I got to click it. Cool. There you go. It should be good now. Sorry about that. Got it. No worries. Um, Okie doke. Oh, I'm on the last slide. This is what Mike was talking about with the incremental impact of the solar, uh, but I'll get there anyway. Um, I was told that we had 15 minutes today, so we probably just have a few left. Uh, do not need to dive into all this material in detail, but um, let's let's stop as it makes sense. I know yeah, you're, you're not on a strict time constraint. We just had a couple of real uh, marathon meetings the last few months. So we're trying yeah. to make this one shorter and sweeter. That's all. But if you're doing us too, stuff, you keep on trucking, Rory. Organizationally, that is a, that's a great aspiration of ours. <laughs> make meetings 50% shorter. Yeah. Um, Anyhow, so I, it's nice to see everyone's face again. A lot of familiar faces here. I, we gave background on the company last time around and gave a, a kind of quick intro to what we thought would make sense here, uh, not having had the benefit yet of going around to uh, look at sites and, and best locations. And um, so things have, have evolved a little bit since then, and we performed this sizing analysis which um i mean not to uh, not to be a spoiler but it it proved that we could basically max out the system vis-a-vis -vis, uh the big ticket interconnection threshold in iso new england at five megawatts we stay below that uh we avoid a lot of costs that would otherwise undermine the project economics um and our study indicates that, that we really should maximize uh, to the extent we can get up to 4.99. We took the feedback from you, Mike, and, and uh, we have a lot of comfort that we can um, get to a, a 4.85 megawatt threshold without any issue. Uh, so if we subject that constraint to ourselves, that's kind of, that's how we were thinking about the economics of the project. Um, and I will 
speak to those um, as is uh, opportune here while, while we walk through it. Um, as all of you probably know, and feel free to just accelerate me if, if I'm saying redundant stuff here, uh, but the objective of this project is to sit on the system and anticipate the 12 monthly coincident peak events that drive uh, transmission charges and anticipate the single annual uh, capacity peak in ISO New England. Uh, so 13 windows that we're aiming to hit um, and uh, position the battery to reduce uh, local network service charges to the extent that those exist at all. So the sizing analysis, again, um, it yielded a uh, very positive outlook. We can go essentially as large as we want to, uh, take into account a physical constraint that Mike shared with us and we're you know, fine uh, at the 4.85 megawatt mark. You see here, <clears throat> here in this table, the, the maximum load the minimum monthly coincident peak load, the average monthly coincident peak loads. Uh, the system load is below 4.99 megawatts or 4.85 megawatts. Uh, but what is driving the calculus is um, the scale economies of building a larger battery versus uh, always respecting in you know, an absolute corner case uh, the full ability of the system to dispatch and not be constrained. So um, what you see here, actually, if I jump down a few slides, apologies for uh, bumping around. In the appendix, there's our sizing analysis showing uh, a, a um, histogram of the uh, monthly coincident peak loads over time. And as you can see, they are, you know, moving around the five megawatt mark, um, even in lower months. And in one outstanding month, uh, we have that low that was referenced in, in the previous table. Uh, but for the most part, you can always be maximizing your output to hit these coincident peak events and therefore taking the hit on, you know, the, the capex per megawatt by reducing the system size in such an instance, it does not make sense. So it's an economic optimization. Sorry, I'm having PDF issues. Uh, it's an economic optimization uh, in addition to a, you know, a, a N minus uh, two constraint situation. Um, here's the, the annual coincident peak also dancing around the five megawatt mark. This is a lot less valuable, uh, so consider it in the optimization with this chart as being less of a driver because the, the dollar per kilowatt month impact on uh, the, the bills for Hardwick are going to be a lot smaller. Um, jumping back up to the top. So here was that minimum that you saw in the uh, long run uh, monthly coincident peak chronology uh, and the max and the average, you know, dancing around the five megawatt mark. And that lands us here comfortably at uh, just short of five megawatts. Um, hours below that, the very few, what you saw on those two charts was, um, what you saw on those two charts was the, the peak events, um, not the percentage of hours below. Um, so we, we had a consultation with Mike, um, we came out of that and performed some fatal flaw analysis on the different options. Um, and what we determined was after looking at, uh, you know, spacing and wetlands and floodplains and topographical concerns, uh, NIMBY concerns potentially. Um, determined that the Billings Road site was the best and we could safely build uh, a sufficiently large battery on uh, a, a adequately small footprint there, uh, about a quarter of an acre, 0.3 acres. 
This is a overhead shot of the site area off of Billings Road. And here's a, a site layout. Maybe Joe, you can speak to this for a quick moment. Yeah, so uh, what you're seeing here is a, a kind of standard arrangement of our system, um, depending on ultimate availability and kind of surveying of the site, there's options to arrange differently. But um, in the lower right hand corner, uh, you have our switch gear, which uh, interconnect uh, into uh, the feeder coming down Billings Road. And then uh, beneath that, uh, we connect to two PCS transformer skids. Um, yeah, where Roy's cursor is, and then uh, into the DC blocks of the battery system. So there's a battery interface cabinet, and behind each of those, uh, a series of batteries. Um, and then uh, in addition to all that, we have uh, auxiliary power and communications equipment that enables us to uh, power everything up and communicate and operate the system remotely. So there's space <clears throat> there in your plan for basically like another two and a half megawatts of batteries in the future, perhaps? Yeah, effectively. Uh, we basically are leaving room to be flexible on uh, future augmentation. Um, really, it's it's more designed for adding uh, energy than it is power capacity, but you could, um, uh, with an AC coupled augmentation, we can add power capacity as well. Okay, so... Um... Yeah, a few questions. So the you know viability, optimization, uh, location, uh, all, all that stuff. It, it's great, but it's it seems like it's more for your internal, uh, for your information internally. Because I don't see any information. I, I know that's another step, uh, but uh, about what exactly the savings are and the structure of the contract is. And uh, and I know last last time you guys made a presentation and there's a you had a 25 year requirement uh, in the contract for providing this the service. And um, I wanted to know if that was still the same. And if you had any actual like a spreadsheet of of savings based on, you know, uh, uh, specific discharges and back to my other question, uh, who's charging it? How's, how's, how does that? Uh, is there a PPA with Hardwick Electric for charging. I mean, how does how does all that stuff work? I, that's that's what's I, I feel like is what's relevant to Hardwick Electric. I mean, the feasibility is great, but uh, the project's nothing without savings or, or value to Hardwick Electric and the ratepayers. Yeah. Um, so I can I can speak to that briefly. Um, situation has been in flux a bit, right? Um, the price of batteries went up by over 30% in the first quarter of 2022. Um, two months ago, we got something that took us back in time to the end of 2021. Uh, with the Inflation Reduction Act, we have a tax credit now that we can monetize on standalone energy storage. And it's worth 30% of the capex of the project. Um, you know, in practice, uh, there are some costs associated with it. There are some ways you can kind of uprate the cost of the project a little bit, uh, but call it for simplicity, 30% off um, in a price environment where costs went up 30%, right? So we're, we're uh, measuring the, this fluctuation as we go through the permitting processes and we go through the interconnection processes on the first BEPSA resources. Um, all that is to say, things look a lot better today than they did a couple of months ago. Um, so we're, we're kind of breathing a sigh of relief that the economics are still very compelling. Um, if I uh, give you a, an example, because we are still teething on the impacts of the Inflation Reduction Act, um, I can send over a spreadsheet to you, Vince, if that's helpful for, for you to kind of play around with numbers on. Uh, but for a system of this size, I believe that we're looking at an annual bill to Hardwick of somewhere around $750,000. Uh, we're looking at a savings 
exposure or a cost exposure that we will be directly reducing of 1.2 million and then, then climbing fast associated with that amount of capacity. So uh, think about a number in the region of $750,000 a year uh, fixed for 20 years, and it was not 25 years, but it was 20 years. While the the cost exposure that you're mitigating directly with that payment is 1.2 million today, and it's climbing over time. Um, that is, you know, the quantum of of savings you're talking about. It would be north of 50 percent of the addressable costs. That this battery is is put there to to deal with it, right? Um, so I am very confident that will be hugely compelling economic rationale to move forward. Um, and and we're working closely with Sean on you know getting to the finish line there. Um, it's just there are moving pieces that are that we are managing on an ongoing basis. Um, um, well, and what if you miss the peaks? Yeah, I mean, that's that's the nice part for our partners. We we have assumed 100% of the performance risk. So the biggest risk is that we don't save, you know, the money that we hoped we would. We so save half of it um, and you pay half of what you were expecting to pay. Um, if we have, call it for simplicity, a five megawatt battery, in the ground and we're only able to successfully dispatch 2.5 megawatts of that throughout the course of the year, then the cost of the project to you will be 50% lower. The savings will be 50% lower. But we're still paying the 750,000. No, that would be prorated based on the amount of capacity we are able to inject. So, it's going to go down to 375,000 if we are only able to put half of the battery into the system during the coincident peak events. So you're equating, I mean, it's, it's injected power regardless of whether there's a technical limitation or if you just, the timing was bad. That's correct. Okay. And the, it, it should be very high. NPV, depending on how you, you determine these things, uh, it should be exceptionally high and exceptionally low risk. It, with a, like with much more storage penetration, you know, uh, uh, utility scale and behind the meter, those coincident peaks are going to be, I mean, they're going to be suppressed over time, which is going to make the savings potentially a lot less, uh, you know, as it, as it, as it, and 25 years is a long time to commit with things changing that quickly. It's 20 years, but but it would you are not committed to do anything but distribute savings shares to us, basically, right? Like we have to we have to perform. So if it becomes more difficult for us to perform, that's our burden and our risk exposure. Um, so can I can I jump in? So uh, next month, Vince and the rest of my board, we're going to get a full presentation proposal from DeLorean talking about all the numbers, et cetera. This discussion is really, my intention was for this to be a 30,000 down from the first 30,000 down to a, maybe a 15,000 foot view and get a little bit more in the weeds and explain what's happened since your original discussion, but an actual presentation is what you'll be getting next month. Okay, great. So the this next one, that'll be the business proposition and contract. Yes. And it, will it include the implementation plan or timing? So we know if we give you a go, you know, what, what it looks like. Actually, yeah, I, think we, Rory, I think Rory has a typical timeline to share here with you tonight. Oh, good. We, we do, yeah. Um, and, I, you know, it's good to get a high level frame of reference on the savings. They're, they're very good. Um, we are finding that uh, there's a lot of appetite and traction for 
systems that can that can reduce demand charges for municipal utilities. So I, I as Mike suggests, we will go into the weeds on that um, during the November presentation. Yeah. Uh, so I'll keep and, cruising and, through. Yeah. I was just gonna say, and anything else you guys want, right? Like that's the if if that's our our opportunity to get dig into the details. I mean, contractual structures you know, system pricing, savings. I mean, uh, yeah, we- Mike, Mike, if you can get us uh, kind of your, uh, whatever your proposed uh, contract would be, we're gonna put our pit bull named Lynn on it. And uh, <laughs> oh, he's gonna tell you what you're gonna do and not gonna do. <laughs> yeah. So I, I had a question on that, that Mike, because we're we are negotiating the first of those with Vepsa right now uh, for the Northfield project, and I was thinking, um, it might be a a friendlier interaction with your pit bull if we had sort of a a <laughs> uh, a contract that already had the Vipsa stamp of approval on it. And we had some some precedent on what they thought would work, so I'm, I we're happy to provide our template, um, but we didn't we didn't know how efficient it would be starting from scratch with Vipsa and starting from scratch with Hardwick kind of at the same time. Um, so yeah. welcome some thoughts there, but I we were looking for ease of uh, negotiation if possible. Okay, we can have a chat about that. I say pitbull, but Lynn is. Uh, <laughs> But I mean, Lynn is, Lynn is an expert at mm -hmm. power contracts. That's what she does. And, okay. You know, we've start we started off with her with the developer for the H11 for the solar project. This would be next to, it. and it really mm -hmm. started rough because, you know, they thought she was being a pit bull, and she's really just a T crosser and I daughter, and she wants it all right. It has yeah. to be right because yeah. she doesn't want to worry about somebody 11 years from now worrying about X that Lynn didn't, you know, think about. Yeah. So she's very thorough. And she's a very thorough pit bull. That's what I'll say. <laughs> well, said, well said. But I still think it does help to have the VEP. So it does move you down. Yes. Across. Yeah. So it's good. Yeah. So, so just uh, without getting into the weeds, just for example, priority over, it said you guys would be, uh, trying to capitalize on other uh, battery services like uh, voltage support or uh, you know frequency support um, and priority of that service you know if it's more valuable to you to provide that than it is for the discharge for the peak shaving for example you know having that kind of thing in the contract yeah, yeah it's, well, it's, it's, those those values Vince, in the iso new england market are really for um you know, once once every 10 year emergency condition happens. I mean, I don't remember in the last 20 years that we had an un under frequency load shed event or or a um, capacitive uh, voltage support need other than routine cap bank switching. So I don't know that there's even a market yet for those items that these guys would be looking to get into. Yeah, great. I mean, that's good to hear, but it would still have to, it's, it would still require you know the uh, the the hierarchy of uh, yeah that that oh, just, yeah, absolutely that that language exists in all of our contracts that the highest priority service is the service facing our utility partners and then you know occasionally we can find other ways to monetize the resource to help support the economics of the terms facing the utility uh, in this case. It's not great at the moment. The outlook doesn't seem particularly rosy. So uh, we may well not be doing very much other than peak shaving with the battery. Hey Mike, this location, does it require any special approvals from other parties like agriculture department, hardwood trails, whoever might be involved? Are we okay at this site? It's, it's right now it's part of the H11 project and permit. And I actually had a meeting with Eli about this and uh, he said, that's not a problem. It would actually kind of grease the skids a little because there's no additional clearing. There's no additional development. There's no new roads. There's no new power lines. 
this thing just kind of plops in with its own permit within a permit of the H11 and we're off and running. Great. He great. thought it he thought it was a great uh, option from from the regulatory limitate or regulatory process perspective. And Roy, once this is in, what's the requirements of HED personnel to do anything to make this work properly? Zero hands off and it's all you. It's all these guys. Okay. Yeah, no, no requirements. And no where are most of the battery components manufactured? Where do we get what are the products that where are we buying them from? Uh, well, it depends a little bit, but um, they may the the lithium ion battery packs may come from China. Um, we're going to try to source as much domestically as we can because there's actually now an incentive to do so. And with the, the Inflation Reduction Act, you have a domestic content adder for the investment tax credit. Uh, candidly, it feels like a wash at best. Um, and supply pressures are, are moving towards the US market as that, that signal came through in the Inflation Reduction Act. So, you know, the, the phones are blowing up of all the uh, US-based integrators that source most of their components domestically. Um, it's a long way of saying, be, be totally transparent with you as that crystallizes, but uh, we're still pretty far out here. So the only way to be certain is to pay for the battery. And uh, you don't want to do that until you got a permit. That 30% is pretty awesome. So, Aurora, I have um, on a number of occasions in the last couple of months tried to explain to children of mine and grandchildren exactly how peak shaving works, particularly when, as I understand it, they're only, we're only going to have 13 peaks, one per month and a special one. Can you give me in three or four sentences the description of peak shaving that I can remember and that my grandchildren will understand even if they're in college? <laughs> uh, man, let me, let me try and boil this down to three or four sentences. Uh, my, my guys are gonna mock me when I screw this up. Um, yeah, it's being recorded yeah. too. Damn. <laughs> we usually take five pages. To right talk about <laughs> I'm not interested in five pages. <laughs> um, yeah, so the battery is is incorporating. How long can the sentences be? I'll let you decide. <laughs> okay, we employ sophisticated predictive analytics to anticipate when those coincident peak events will occur with a very high degree of accuracy. We prepare the battery for when those events will occur and by charging it up and we discharge the battery in advance of those events occurring. We charge it up and position it more than we discharge it. Uh, we discharge it more than the coincident peaks actually occur because we want to be in a margin of, of safety to successfully enjoy those uh, those energy cost savings. My grandchildren have no idea what you mean by a coincident peak. All right, Mike, your turn. Three sentences. <laughs> a coincident peak, I mean, Mike a coincident me? peak is, is easy. <laughs> is Whichever easy. Mike wants to take a shot at it. Yeah. So our, our fees, Nat, uh, the, the monthly peak and the annual coincident peak when the whole, when the, when ISO New England peaks and when Vermont peaks. Peak of what? Load, the highest load measured for any given interval in that month or in that year. So that's the one per year is the 13. The one per month are the other 12. And those 13 items cost us roughly $1.3 million a year. So we're so going to say the peak shaving that these guys are going to do, if we did what they're going to do on our own, and we, we paid for the equipment and whatever, we would shave that $1.2 million down to zero. But these guys need to make some money too. So they're going to charge us roughly $750,000 to save us $1.2 million in the early 
parts of the agreement. So 1.2 million on 13 is about 100,000 each time on a three hour basis. In three hours, we're gonna save $100,000? Yeah, and you explain, Mike, what, what do we pay per kilowatt hour during those Quints and Peaks? It's, it's an outrageously high kilowatt hour rate. Right, this isn't about energy. This is about capacity. Okay, well, this it's is a, it's a, it's $100,000 an hour. It is 100,000 an hour, yes. Well, it, I mean, the, the underlying cost driver is ISO New England is determining what the transmission capacity needs to be for those peaks. And then it's so, so, for example, Hardwick Electric sells power to Jasper Sellers. And Jasper Sellers makes cheese, and then we charge them energy fees for kilowatt hours that they use, energy over time. But we also charge them a demand rate for their highest coincident peak of themselves uh, for the highest 15 minutes over the billing cycle. So our meter looks every 15 minutes. What was it this time? 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 And it records the highest one. And that's what we bill them for on their demand. It's the same kind of principle that we are in, but we're in a big pool with the rest of New England all doing it at the same time. And what Nat's asking, I mean, this is what it is, but not why it is. I mean, ISO New England's making these determinations to 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 figure out what the transmission capacity needs to be and what the cost. Yes, uh, and determining a rate. Yes, determining the rate to be able to to be able to support that transmission capacity, and then they, they distribute it based on your actual demand. And if your if your load is higher, then you get a higher percentage of that total cost. And if it's lower, then you get a lower percentage. And that that's that's where it comes from. Does that that make sense, Nat? No, okay. he's right. <laughs> right. Okay, so ISO New England, you know, they, they have there's a have a huge transmission. I in, thought we had reduced tremendously <laughs> our transmission expenses. No, That's, no, I, I am. We bought a transmission line. That's yeah. within our system, though, but it's not. Yeah. No, that no, the, this. So right now we pay transmission fees also. Uh, to our wholesale provider, which is Green Mountain Power. I have yet to sign the agreement with Morrisville to buy into their transmission line, which is gonna cost us like 300 plus thousand dollars. But that will get rid of the Green Mountain Power transmission costs, which is part of this equation, but not part of the ISO New England number. So in three hours, once a month, Rory thinks that we will save well over $100,000. Yes. It's not really once a month, right? It's whenever it happens in the month. It could happen 10 times. No. no it's one hour of every month, and the highest hour of the year makes 13 right. events. Yeah. The highest hour in the month and the highest hour in the year. So, yeah. you know, you, you may have 10 peaks, but only one of them is going to be the highest level, the highest number. So that's that's what it is. But then... You know the batteries dispatched multiple times, more than one time a month to make sure that we right. catch the right peak. But you know, but each one is just the whoa. one peak, the whoa. one most. Whoa, 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 whoa! So it's not going to work just once a month. It's going to be checking other times too. It's going to be to, in order to ensure that we do hit the peak. We need to we need to try to hit it more times than just the times that actually exists right we need to we need to employ uh, a a margin of safety on it right so right so on, what if what if four four times as many <laughs> cycles as uh four times as many discharges as uh would be required right to, so if delorean determined that hey they're going to hit one megawatt we need to dispatch the battery tomorrow and they do it and then the next week, oh, geez, it looks like we're going to hit one megawatt, but it discharge the battery again, or we might miss. Oh, next week, geez, it looks like we're going to hit 1.1, better dispatch it again. Right. So, so it's it, it, re, <laughs> it reestablishes itself throughout the month, right? Um, There's a tremendous assumption of understanding here. Uh, <laughs> when you match yeah. to the battery, that means 
put into the system the energy that's been stored in the battery rather than use the solar that is being generated or rather than buying on the spot market well yes the solar really isn't part of this equation now because so ignore that that's even there this okay. eliminates us buying our percentage off iso new england right it doesn't eliminate it it reduces it and we, so our, and we and we look at six to nine p.m because that's a time when there's a demand we obviously aren't doing any solar then and the worry is that the spot market is expensive at that time. Is that yes. all? That's part of it. Yes. Okay. So we so we try to dispatch, as we said, the battery just before that and during that time. I can't hear you. You can't hear me. No. Nope. It's kind of going in and out. Uh, I don't know. So, so I, I mean, that's a that's a point that that Nat's making. So, are, is the PPA going to have a capacity component too uh, for for spot market coverage? I mean, besides the uh, uh, you know besides the uh, the peak shaving. I mean, I'm, I'm not. Does that? Uh, it, I think that's it, an in the weeds question that we're not okay. ready for. Yeah, we can't participate in the market for capacity with the resource while reducing your capacity obligations in the system. So I'm not sure if I've understood your question perfectly well, Vince, but I think the answer is no. We would not be doing that. Okay, yeah, I, I guess that would be redundant <laughs> is, is what it would be. There are rules to prevent that, right? Um, so that was uh, about 150 sentences, I think. So Nat, come see me tomorrow. We'll have coffee and talk. I mean, I would think the biggest one is like, you know, one, the, the highest, you know, the town uses a certain amount of energy and each month the highest amount of energy is uh, reduced so that whoa, you know, whoa, whoa. you're not doing Okay. Each month, the highest amount is reduced. No, yes. not being reduced. Well, okay. Yes. Thanks, Mike. Yes, yes. It is. Instead of us using the grid, we're going to use the battery. Come see me tomorrow, Matt. Uh, it'll be really interesting to see the the um, components of the contract. Okay, you wrote in uh, one of these pages that this will reduce the load of the Walcott substation. Why is that? Because it's going to pump energy into our distribution system in Hardwick and so much energy that it's going to back feed, it's going to go backwards through the substation into the transmission system, down the transmission line to the Wolcott substation and serve those customers as well. But then isn't that just wasting what was Wolcott was generating? No, Wolcott will still be generating, but the other power will be coming from this installation rather than the transmission system. So I, I have a question just still related to peak shaving. So say theoretically you get the, the load is zero. I mean, the... the the, the construct that ISO New England is using, this you know intermittent uh, monthly and annual peak, if the load is zero, there must still be some uh, base charge that they're charging. Uh, and uh, is that the case or, or would ISO New England's, uh, their transmission tariff actually go, go away if you hit it perfectly every time? They or, would effectively go away megawatt for megawatt. Okay, so megawatt for megawatt, but they would still. Uh, if, you had, if you had zero, there'd be nothing the battery could do. And that's right. it's the uh, sizing. The sizing analysis is you know what are the minimums, right? What are the I'm, maximums. Yeah, I'm not talking about the the electrical capacity or or, or the system. I'm actually talking about the pr the price, the cost, how they calculate. Is there is there a a base cost you know like a base charge like a uh, thousand uh, dollars that they charge no matter what and then on top of that uh you know it's like n plus 
uh, uh, load times um, whatever the whatever whatever the uh, percentage is based on your. It's uh, it's it's very simply a dollar per kilowatt month construct, and it is reduced kilowatt for kilowatt that you reduce your own load. So if you're at zero, then you won't be paying the transmission charges or uh, the capacity obligations. Okay. So if everyone if everyone is able to with storage reduce their uh, demand to zero, then essentially no one would be paying transmission charges for that year if they did it over the course of a year. Yes, but it, when it happens uh, comprehensively, then you have challenges, right? Because the, the coincident peak starts to move around as people are chasing it. Well, there's there's also a ton there's a ton of utilities that are not not incentivized to do this, right? Like every utility in New England that owns transmission is not going to undermine their own abilities to recover the cost for transmission. So there's a small subset of customers that pay these transmission charges and are actually incentivized to do this peak shaving. So there's no risk of the entire system shaving their peaks and those this this me mechanic going away. And that, that's, um, like and no invest, no investor owned utility is going to do this because they'd rather get paid for their transmission. Right. Um, it's just smaller transmission dependent utilities like Hardwick and the rest of the VIPSA membership that have major incentives to do this. Okay. That, that's really good information. And that kind of supports uh, what I was starting to suspect is actually a really artificial. I mean, it's, it's an exploitation of an artificial limitation and uh, the fact that um, major utilities uh, or, or utilities that own transmission uh, aren't have no incentive is I, I think that's a real flaw in the system, g given the fact that uh, storage is so important. But in, in any case, that's 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 a separate issue. OK, so we're way over time. Here, I'll just, so just Rory, flip to the Roy, you can wind this up because we have a full audit to get through tonight. Okay. All right. Well, I'll, I'll leave it here because uh, someone had requested this. I don't think it was Vince. Um, if we were to kick off in the November timeline, you got to really squint your eyes to you really squint your eyes on this one. I <laughs> put on my glasses. Zoom. Uh, sorry. Can you zoom in on the, the Gantt chart there? Yeah, let me. Uh, okay, how's that for people over there? I, I was the one who asked, and I don't really need all the detail down below. The top half of the page just shows. Yeah, the, okay. the dates on the top, it takes a year to get a permit and so, six yeah. months to okay. build it. Yeah, okay. it's a two year so process, not, is basically the takeaway. Problem. Yeah, okay, yeah. great. So if you, if, if, Hardwick Electric signed an agreement with you today. You think it's going to take two years to get a CPG? The only, the only reason yeah. is because we can't do the environmental analysis that we need to do uh, until, ne until, next, until next spring. Right. So I forgot we, about that. You can't do yep. them after September or something. Yeah, the, the plants are dying and the bunnies are hibernating. And uh, <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, we probably know later than this month, so that wouldn't work out. Yeah, we, we ran into the same problem with the solar project. We didn't get it done by September and had to wait. So I forgot about that, though. That's good, though. That gives us a deadline for uh, it gives us a, a clear window for your pit bull to do the work. And that work has <laughs> got to wrap up when we get the environmental going. That's right. And when did you guys think you can get us a contract or an outline of a contract? Say a week or a month, was it? Well, we can send the template contract that we've sent to VIPSA already. I, I would, I would uh, suggest that we not start negotiating that contract in earnest until we have a precedent in place with VEPSA and they've at least given a version of it, their stamp of approval. I think that will make every, everyone's yeah. lives easier here. 
What's the um, prognosis on getting that, Mike? How far out is that? The one with VIPSA? Uh, I mean, hopefully very soon. We will be sending them a price for the Northfield project around which we will be negotiating that, that contract hopefully this week. Um, and it's kind of in Ken and Sean's hands, I guess, after that. But, uh, you know, I certainly can get you guys, like I said, the template. We can get you a term sheet that largely reflects that contract um, prior to the discussion at the next meeting. Um, and happy to field any questions that folks have, you know, at that meeting about it. Um, that sounds perfect. But I, I would, you know, and I would suggest instead of like redlining that document and actually negotiating at that meeting, we wait until we have a, a VIPSA template to work from. The, te the template is sounds great. Um, is the template th uh, through VEPSA? Is this with, I mean, you'd be providing, this would be a contract between DeLorean and Hardwick Electric Department, not uh, with VEPSA. Uh, as a, with a master agreement, uh, as they do with power purchases, the the for, the former, but but uh, you know, VEPSA will be very hands on with our first uh, PPA in Northfield. Okay. So VEPSA is willing to do it either way. If you guys want to be the counterparty on the contract, you can be the counterparty on the contract. But VEPSA is flexible, and I think in most, if not all instances, it will be with the municipal utility. Right. Great, so, you know, I think we reconvene with uh, the business uh, terms and a fuller presentation. Uh, that would be followed by us beginning to pour real resources into this, um, get the system studied, formally with an engineering partner and uh, begin the permitting process in earnest and uh, CPG process in the spring. Well, th thanks. Uh, one final question. So just thinking about what you said about uh, having an interest if you have uh, transmission facilities. So you guys, as, as a business, you would be looking for utilities without transmission facilities, essentially, that would be able to save through peak shaving as customers i mean i'm just thinking that it, it, we we have many different business cases but in this instance absolutely that's okay. where you know the the majority of the value lies okay thanks thank you guys very much look forward to seeing the next piece thanks guys thanks a lot guys take care Sorry to drone on a bit. Mike uh, asks we can talk about when the next meeting is and you can let me know. And yeah, right. we'll do. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thanks, Thank you. My grandchildren will be happy. <laughs> After you meet Mike tomorrow, you'll be happy. <laughs> I'll practice on my, my 15 year my 15 month old boy uh, as uh, as preparation for, for next <laughs> go around. I think, um, need to reduce the sentences greatly. All right, guys. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, this uh, Chris, you're up next. You want to just walk us through what you have here, or do you want to just wait for us to give you questions? Okay. No, he'll walk. He'll walk us through. Okay. Hello, guys. I am uh, Chris Galat. I'm the partner in the charge of the St. Albans office, Sam Peish, and we. Pretty much staff the audit out of the St. Johnsbury office with two ladies over there. It's been pretty helpful for me. And actually, we've had a you know, we were able to do most of it remotely, you know, and it went a lot smoother this year. Beth, Beth was very helpful. We got everything going in the right direction, I believe. It made it a lot easier not having some convoluted schedules to try to maneuver around it. Uh, but we're also having, as everybody else is, staffing issues and trying to get everything done timely. And uh, I think we're a little bit earlier this year, but we just kind of dragged it out over the summer trying to get everything final reviewed. But we had pretty much the good numbers, I think, by May for the most part. 
the May or June. Uh, I can start off with the financial statements. Uh, you can see on page one of financial statements, it kind of changes the format of the report. Now they want the opinion being first, kind of different, but basically it's telling you that you had a, a clean opinion. Everything was presented in accordance with GAAP, with no deficiencies. Uh, I can I can go through quickly just some of the differences in line items, but I, I don't know how much, I don't think you want to get, want me to get into too much detail. Maybe give us a big overview and then we can ask you specific questions. Of what okay, seeing. well, the, 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 big, the, the, the big change. The big is, overview, Chris, the big overview and really like to hear any uh, additional kudos you can share about Beth because I'm pretty happy <laughs> and, I, and I think that uh, she has really got this boat off the bottom of the pond. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, the, the, if you go to page four is the statement of net position, which basically shows your assets. Let me just clarify something real quick, real quick Chris. Um, in our board packet, our board packet page numbers are up on the top right, but what Chris is seeing is his audit report and his numbers, page numbers at the bottom. Right. You want to share your screen, Chris, or just walk us through the paper? I can just walk you through. I can do okay. it. Once I get to the, the page, and then just, it'll just go from there. Okay. Uh, so basically, the, the big change is in the... I have a quick question on this one. It'll be short, I promise. Um, um, inventory at a quarter of a million bucks there. Um, how do you account and value your inventory? And, and what's and basically where I'm coming from is, you know, how confident are we? As a private industry manufacturing guy, inventory sometimes can bite you. So is this is this um, you know, is this stuff, Mike, where you you're out there, you can see it's all lined up in the warehouse. Boom, boom, boom. We counted it. We know its yep. value. Done. Yes. yes. What we do, it's a three step process, Roger. Uh -huh. Twice a year, twice a year, we do a full eval on our, on our inventory. Okay. Every inventory item is counted. Um, so we do a first count in the warehouse. One group counts everything, another group counts everything. So a second group, if those two groups numbers match, we give them the bet. Right. If they don't match, then I go do a recount. So a third okay. set of eyes goes to count. And as soon as we get two that match, those go to bet. Mm -hmm. We do okay. the same thing on the trucks. So anything that's rolling down the road and that's inventory that gets counted, anything in the warehouse, anything on the property at the warehouse, transformers, et cetera, all gets a double count. I sign off on all those and then they go to Beth and she lines them up against the system, her and Karen. Super. Okay. So I can I can take it to the bank. Yes. Yep. Okay, so on the uh, statement of position on the asset side, there was pretty good increase in cash, but that was mostly from the uh, the the settlement from the prior auditors back in the 2000s that you received $649,000 that pretty much helped out with your increase in cash receivables are up about 250,000 but 136,000 of it is from the uh the Crassberry settlement that's in that receivables account also uh the rest the rest of the activity on the uh, in the assets were pretty much reasonable at the prior year. There's a, just a few, about three hundred thousand dollars in increase in investments, and the net property equipment actually went down a little bit because of the depreciation. Uh, the deferred outflows from the pension that remained about the same, just about an eighteen thousand dollar increase, but that's not the one that. You, you want staying the same. You want that one more increasing compared to what's on the next page is the uh, basically your liabilities and net position. 
Yeah. So go, going back to the, the the pension, if you don't mind. Yeah. So I mean, this is this is essentially uh, the deferred. It, it's a it's a it's a con continuing liability that's increasing. Well, th that's the asset. So I'm getting to the liabilities on is on this next. Oh, okay. Page. Okay. Got it. That's that's the one that you're going to be more worried about. So. Yeah. 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 Okay. Okay. There, there, and most of your liabilities, you know, your actually your accounts payable went down considerably. But, Dave, but before you jump to liabilities on the assets, one of the things that's a little scary for me is we've got a receivable now, the 141,000 with Craftsbury, and the payment terms on that receivable are nine years. And as we go to a higher inflation environment, uh, Beth, you got to keep us on. I mean, that's. That is so far from being cash in hand. You know, it's not 30 days away. It's not 60 days. It's not 90 days. It's nine years. So that is that is billed out on their bill every month. I know. Like the so, agreement. I'm sure we'll get it. It's just we won't get it for a long, long time. So, not not the total amount, no. Yeah, well, we so, just got to be careful. And, and with that, what I could, what what I should, what we should do for next year, if that, you know, would that be the case? Probably something that I missed is the the other years should be shown as a non-current asset, not a current asset. Ads, that's a great idea. That's really good. Yeah. So uh, we can set that up as a separate, you know, in a different year. You know, we'll have a non-current asset it's going to be. Yeah. Uh, I think it's that. a good it's a good asset. It's just not going to be. It's not all current. It's not. Yeah. It's not showing up for a long time. Is okay. is not not non-current i mean as long as it has some additional notation i mean non-current is that a, is that a standard definition non-current or would that require yeah, yeah you put like accounts receivable non-current okay so but it would still as far as the books go it would need to be described as um you know being payable uh, according to a specific schedule yeah So not non-current. I mean, it almost sounds like uh, non-collectible. <laughs> no, not at all. No, it's I, I, just I, an accounting I, term to mean it's not immediately going right. to be received. Well, right. well, well, what we could, what we should call is a, a null receivable current, okay. null receivable non-current. Yes. Okay. That, that's what we'll, we'll just, that's Yeah. What thank we'll you. That's next year. I, I. Yeah, that would be good. Okay, on the liability side, the, the payables are down considerably. I think most of that was the purchase power it was getting more current, I believe, at the end of the year compared to the prior year. Accrued expenses, that's mostly uh, vacation and sick pay accrual. The increase was, the rest of it remained constant. Uh, and then the big one is the net pension liability. Uh, although the net pension liability went down, you see down below where it says deferred inflows. Yeah. That went up. That kind of re just reversed itself. Basically, that's saying that what they calculated for uh, their estimated increase in value of their investments was way off compared to what they actually got for increase in value. So that's where that. That's what that amount really pertains to uh, deferred inflow. And then net position, uh, unrestricted net position is 3,975,000 up from 2,975,000. I'm, 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 I'm sorry, uh, uh, it's enough money where uh, getting this clear in my mind is, uh, is important. So, okay. The money from the pension fund goes into, I mean, it's invested. Is that right? That's correct. It's, and so they anticipate, they estimate what the value is going to be based on a, a return, specific return. Yeah. And this return was actually less than anticipated. So, uh, and this is a return on the, uh, on the deferred, on the deferred payment. Right. Okay, so uh, the the calculation is made retroactively, and then it's reduced by the amount of the actual return based on whatever the spec 
specifications of the invest the investment are. Is that right? Yeah. So if, if you look on page, I can get to it later on, but on page 22 of the footnote disclosures, that kind of gives you a summary of how it's the where the differences are. So, so if it had made more money, if, it, if the return had been higher, then the pension liability could have gone up. The, the, the liability would go down if, they're, if the investments did better, their liability should go down. And they, they are going, they are, if you look on, you know, I'll, I'll, show, I'll show you that later on. I got the very last page of that report. You can, if you can slide down to that very last page, which is the department proportionate share of the net pension liability. What page number is that? Uh, page 27. Okay. I guess I'm a little confused. If it hasn't been funded yet, you're making an estimate of the return on money that hasn't been funded, put into the fund. Is that right? Money's it's a it's a pension, so money's been put into it. But based on what they have to pay out, this is their calculation of what this page twenty seven will tell you. The okay. fiduciary net position as percentage of the total pension liability is eighty six percent. That's telling you that it's fourteen percent underfunded. The goal is to have that at one hundred percent. That way, it's fully funded. But right now, the Vermont Municipal Employee Retirement System is 14% underfunded. But the prior year, it was 26% underfunded. I don't know what it's gonna be this year with the way the market's been going. <laughs> it's gonna go right back down to that 74%. But it's, basically it's all done by actuaries and we just, re we report what the numbers are that the actuaries give us. Okay, I just want to make sure I understand how the liability is working. But but Vince, I I think what you might want to do if you want to sort of educate yourself on pension accounting, maybe do it separately, you know, with not with this uh, this group. Yeah. But with the municipal Vermont Municipal Employees Retirement System. Yeah, that's that's a good idea. Cuz they're just delivering it to us and right. we're yeah. we're just putting it in here. But, you know, as a matter of policy for us, I do agree, you know, we should watch the unfunded portion and we don't want to be like every other government around the country and just systematically build up an unfunded pension liability. The state of Vermont's done it, you know, lots of government companies do it less than governments do it. And I think it's, I think it's kicking the can down the road and, and, and understating the expense of running our our, our operation and then somebody's somebody eventually has got to pay these pensions and all we're when we underfund we're saying that somebody is later right so so that is something we i think we could do we could say we we want to be we want to we want to contribute more i think we could do that i don't know you know but that's something else we could take up it's nothing to talk about tonight i don't think well that, that's where if you look at their a through F, whatever different plans they have, some of those plans are paying the companies paying 10%, like uh, the sheriff's department, the sheriff's fund, they got to pay 10%. The employer portion is 10%, and the employees is only like four or 5%. Right, right now, we're at five and a quarter to 6% in, the, in this, in the VMERS. Fund B or okay. Uh, let's go to page six under statements of revenue expenses and change in net position. You see that the charges for services were up about two hundred and seventy thousand dollars. That settlement income is that's the Crossberry settlement. Uh, you look at the operating expenses, purchase power was up about 
uh, $370,000. I was comparing that to two years ago, it was at like 3,450. So I don't know if last year you just didn't, there wasn't as much usage in 2020. I'm not sure why there's a big, a big increase compared to 2019. Yeah, we had some strange waves there with COVID hitting us and actually had a bunch of arrearages too that we were dealing with. Actually, Beth has an update on those later, but yeah, we had a couple anomaly years for sure. Okay. The rest of the expenses are pretty much, pretty much in line for, end up with the operating loss of 45,000 due to that big increase in the purchase power. But, uh, you know, we had that net settlement income, which was very helpful. So you end up with a total change in net position of 1,027,000. Yeah, so and your overall net position at the end of the year was 8,978,617. Uh, I don't know if you want me to go through the cash flows at all, or if you just want me to go over some of the items on the footnotes you know it's so i think the the cash flow and all the numbers here are so long ago and our our situation that's developing is of this year 2022 so it's almost it's almost so old it's it's not you know it's it's less worthwhile to invest the time i think michael yeah, I, I think we got a lot to talk about on cash flow. We've flagged it. We're going to push forward a rate increase case. And, and we got a problem on cash flow when you really take out the one time events, you know, even in this year. Yeah. And then the truth is in 2022, the problems become huge by comparison. And that's more relevant, probably. That's what I'd suggest. Is don't talk it through because. How are your receivables doing in 2022? Is it still the same as last year or is it? It's it's proportionate to the growth. Of, I don't think it's a big problem. So there was a <clears throat> purchase power costs are going to be about uh, 250 to $300,000 over for this year because of multiple factors, Chris. Um, and there was a also BEPSA had a budgeting error involving our H11 solar project, which contributed to that number. But beyond that, we are, you know, we haven't had a rate increase since 2009. And reality is we're way overdue. Mm -hmm. We need one. And, and the numbers are starting to shove that right down our throat. So that's okay, but that's, that's the reality. Okay. I'll go, I'll just go through some of the, the footnote disclosures. Great. Uh, I guess the big one is maybe property and equipment on page 13. 13. You can see where the additions and uh, retirements were reported. You had $284,000 in improvements. And the depreciation was 385,944. So the net reduction in the in the depreciated the capital assets was $101,000. And I will say it was in prior years when we tried to get the depreciation reports, they never printed the one depreciation uh, the capital asset reports at the end of the year. So they only gave it to us at the point in time when we asked them for it, which didn't give us balances that reconciled to the end of the year numbers, which made it very, very difficult to, to test it. We had to kind of back into the numbers, which was uh, quite a few hours of work. So this year was a lot easier knowing that Beth gave us the reports <laughs> that, that were at the year end. Okay, the uh, long-term debt on page 15, Basically, uh, you pay 15,000 in principal on the 2008 bond, you're paying eight, 80 to $90,000 on the 2004 bond and you got a small union bank note 
for the substation transformer. Uh, you pay off 125,500 in principal each year. You'll see on page 16, the debt service requirements to maturity, which includes the, when you uh, ref, refinance the bonds, the basically the interest savings is on that third column where it says savings. I'm doing the, the bond refinancing created, it's, it's still going to save you $41,000 payments over the, over the years. Uh, let's see. That's over the term of the bond. Yeah. It's over the term of the debt. Nice. And then on their note seven commitments, that's basically a footnote disclosure that we get from VEPSA. They send us all this and we just put it into the footnote. So all these numbers are received right from VEPSA. And then note eight is the employee retirement plans. You have the, the pension plan with the 401k plan with uh, the National Rural Electric Cooperative Association. And then they also have the the VMERS plan that talks about all, all the stuff that were required to disclose from VMERS. You'll see on page 21, the member contribution percentages and the employer contribution percentages for the different groups. You, you, you're basically, we're in group A, but now they're group B. And I think Mike's also group C. So you can see the employer contribution percentages. So on, you'll see on page 22, that's where it summarizes what, what makes up the deferred outflows and what's the deferred inflows. One portion of it is the difference between their expected and their actual experience ratings. That's 72,000. The deferred inflow is the difference between the projected and actual actual investment earnings. So that, that's telling me that they were expecting and they were projecting higher investment earnings than what they actually had. Then they have a part of it was their changes in assumptions that they change every few years. Then they have a changes in proportionate share of contributions and the district contribution subsequent to the measurement date. Y'all go online to the Beamers website and look at all these reports and they're pretty well detailed and they have a lot of calculations that go into it. So we, based on these changes, we basically recognize a pension expense of $130,100. And out of that $130,100, your actual contributions were 58,000. So the difference is what they gave us for adjustments to make to your financial statements. So you actually had contributions of 58,000, but their pension expense was, actually the pension expense was 104, 206. And the rest of it's just a bunch of required disclosures. And like I said, if you see on the, the last page, it shows you that what's your share of the net pension liability, what's, what is your net pension liability, what's your employee, covered employee payroll costs. Is there any other, are there any other questions on the yes, financial can you, statement? Let's go back to your page 19. Can I? Your page 19, can you take a look at the top of that? The cost of power. <laughs> what is that? Because <laughs> that's, that's what we paid for power. We should be in great shape. Yeah, that's great. I was just sending an email to Mike asking him, since that came from VEPSA, it's hard to make sense of that. I don't know what that is. 
it's it was uh you know we've got negative numbers positive numbers in there unless i don't know how many decimal points if you should add to that i, I, I can send you i can send you the report i can send mike and beth the report that they send me yeah yeah and they can send it to you that's we think alike mike i would just send it <laughs> Any, really good. Beth, do you or do you or Mike? Mike, do you have any? You're on mute, but yeah, this doesn't make any sense to me either. So please okay. send me what they sent you, Chris, and I'll have a follow up on that. Yeah, great. Before you memorialize this, yeah, this is a great document, though. I love the way everything's all pulled together in one place. We just need to make sure as we memorialize that the numbers are right. I'm busy here. Is there are any more questions on the financial statements? No, it's an enormous amount of work. Uh, I can go over. We have th three other letters that we, we have a management letter, a governance letter doesn't really state much on it, but the, the management letter, I'll, I can go over that quickly, indicating that basically all the management comments that we had from prior years were pretty much corrected in the current year. So we didn't have any issues with the findings that we had from prior year, which is great to see. And we didn't come up with any other management letter comments that we could find for this year. You know, it's, there are a couple, there might've been one, I think minor issue that we did, just did an oral, asked Beth about it. And it basically it was the, the month that we tested was really before everything was implemented. So we, then we just went back and looked at another month that day after the implementation and it was fine. Uh, the only other report would be what we call is a gas, gas report, government accounting standards report, where we've, if we have any issues, we'll give you a, either call it a material weakness or a significant deficiency. Uh, I will state that in 2020, you had three, we've had what we call three material weaknesses. One was with financial reporting. Technically, it's your report. You're supposed to prepare the report. The auditors really aren't supposed to prepare it, but if we prepare it, we have to, if we have the understanding that someone there does, does understand the report totally and could prepare it themselves, then we won't have a finding, but if we don't, if we, like last year, Beth wasn't on board, who doesn't have the understanding of it. So we had the material weakness that of preparing the financial statements, which is basically a standard one for most, most companies. They don't, they have their auditors do it. Uh, last year we had a finding for the general ledger accounts. <coughs> a lot of them not reconciling to the schedule that they were giving us. <coughs> we didn't have that issue this year. And we also had, we had the issue with the cafeteria plan that wasn't being accounted for properly. And that was put in place. This year, the only real finding we had was we still have an issue with, we're still having a minor issue with how it's calculating the, uh, the W-2, the line one taxable wages and line three and line five social security, Medicare wages. So I can, I can talk about that just a second after you pointed that out to us. Um, little backstory, what was found in the 2020 audit, it was fixed in 2021. However, the fix was incorrect. So that's what Chris found during the 2021 audit is that correction that had been done prior to me in 2021 was actually not completely correct. So we have now, that has already been addressed. That has already been fixed for 2022. We should be on the right path and everything should be just fine for 2022. Good. Other than that, is there any other questions? Sounds like we're making your job way too easy, Chris. No, no, no. I just, I just noticed I, it's not getting white. It's getting, it's going. <laughs> That's what I look like you, Mike. <laughs> I don't think you're going to catch me. Uh, uh, my goal is actually, 
is to get it done by the before the due date of it, which is really April 30th. And my goal this year is maybe we can, I, I know Robin and Olivia, they're, they're, they're really short staff where they are and they've, <coughs> it's hard for them to find time in February. <coughs> what we could possibly do is in late, like mid December, do our, our walkthroughs of the controls get that out of the way sure and maybe if we get it get the numbers ready by maybe the end of january i can do end of january first two weeks in february and i think that'll it could possibly work well, I, could, I, I kept a list of everything you asked for last year so i'm already putting the i got my list ready to get it ready he's already got it yeah and I, I got i got one or two staff from from here that i could probably use if Robin and Olivia, but I'd like to try to use Robin and Olivia because they got the experience with with Beth and how everything works. So I'd be <laughs> you know, hopefully my goal is to have a draft by February 28th this year. Nice. I that, that'll Sounds make good. my life that'll make my life a lot easier too. Sounds very good. Great. So Chris has done uh, this is his third audit with us, and we have one more lined up with him. Um, so we'll either be looking to extend that again or do something different, but this will be Chris's fourth one with us. And I've been very happy with him. And I did hear the first lady talking about the federal grants and just make you aware that if you, re if you spend more than $750,000 in federal monies, you're required to have a single audit. So you got to keep it at seven four uh, seven forty nine. <laughs> right. And it, it, it's based on expenditures, not revenue. So you can you can All right. you get seven hundred fifty thousand up front. You can expend it over a two year period and make sure both of them are less than seven fifty. You wouldn't be required to have a single audit. Nice. Fabulous. Well, thank you, Chris. Yeah, and I'll I'll send you that VEPSA report that they get me. Yeah. <laughs> Right. So, yeah, on that, um, I mean, I, I'm hearing you tell us that we have a good audit here. Things look good. There are much better processes and, and uh, confidence in the data that we all provided to you. What do I need Roger and Mike and the rest of the team to, uh, I mean, we know we don't like that document from BEPSA, but uh, is is that going to hold us up from having you approve this thing so I can get it off you know off our desks essentially other than a follow up? Mike, I'd be I'd be fine doing a conditional approval since that that's really immaterial. That's exactly that's, really that's what I'm trying to say. That's sort of informative, but it's actually not an integral part of the audit. It just has to be fixed before it's before it's considered final, because we don't want to memorialize the incorrect number. Yeah. 10-4. And are you OK with that, Mike, you think? Do we do a vote now that we're, I don't what are we doing? Are we? Uh, yeah, you guys, you are one of the things motion? you as a board are required to do is to approve the audit, so. OK, so I, I, am, I move, my, if it's OK, Mike, I'll move to approve the audit um, subject to a correction on the page 19 cost of power exhibit. Second. Well, I just look it over it. It has yep. all negatives in this report. Negative, 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 negative. Any any discussion? Everybody in favor? Done. Motion. So that back. was a unanimous. Who seconded that? Mike. Okay. Thanks. Michael. Michael. Michael, Mike, Michael Herbert. We need some more. Gotcha. Gotcha. <laughs> All right. It's moving on. To, All, right. Uh, All right. Thanks, guys. I'll send a raise. Thank, thank you. Right so much. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Thank really you. appreciate yeah. it, Chris. Yep. On to the GM report. GM report is that the scuba diving was good. It was 
fabulous. <laughs> it really was. We went to uh, Cayman Brock. Oh, I've heard of basic, that. It's yeah. basically a, a rock <laughs> 90 miles from Grand Cayman. There's nothing there, but the diving is world class. No, no bleaching. No. And it's, there's, uh, you know, wall dives on a 4,000 foot drop to, <laughs> to, to, I mean, there's every scope of diving there that you could imagine. It isn't just, you know, walls. It isn't just coral piles. It's unbelievable, unbelievable place. I'd go back there in a heartbeat. Well, and we, had, we went to this little boutique resort <clears throat> that had, I don't know, maybe 30 rooms or something, 40 rooms. And our boat, I think, had nine people on it. Wow. And the other boat, I think, had 20 people on it. And that was it in the whole place. Wow. So we'd be out, we'd go diving all day, come back, lay around the pool. It'd be us and our two friends that went down there. Nobody else anywhere. It's crazy. <laughs> it was great. I loved it. <laughs> That's neat. Excellent. All right. What do we got for questions here? <clears throat> so yeah, these tier these tier one wrecks are becoming a big deal. As you can see, you know, a 25 to 50 cent wreck is now going for 10 bucks. And we were, we would have been, we need to be purchasing 12,000 of those this coming year. So wow. 12,000 at 10 cents is really not a big deal, but at 10 bucks, that's not jump change. <laughs> Where is that price set, Mike? It's driven by the market, and all yeah. these all these big gen companies are are driving that market to the point where we can't even find any tier uh, tier one wrecks to purchase. Uh, it, it does also drive uh, more projects, so it'll catch up at some point. But yeah, yeah. But the issue is the the projects. Um, that make tier one wrecks are primarily hydro and getting new hydro in Vermont is not real popular. Need nuclear. I don't think we're gonna do that, but yes, I'd like to invest in some more nuclear. <laughs> <laughs> okay. On to Beth. I uh, just AMI. Um... Yeah, next month, Ken and Ken, uh, Ken Santamore, <laughs> who's kind of the uh, project manager on the AMI for VEPSA and the general manager, Ken Nolan, are joining us next month to give the full present and get hopefully be looking for all of your blessing on Hardwick Electric being in or out. So you'll get the full Gambit next month as well. Okay. And yeah, it, Mike, for the rate, the rate case, um, uh, last call, Beth was going to be working with Vepsa getting everything ship shape. Is that all happening the way we had hoped? It was kind of a crunch timetable. Yeah. That's the um, next thing. That's the next thing that Beth is going to talk about. Yep. Um, she got all her stuff to Steve Farman before she was away uh, on some vacation. And then Steve was gone the following two weeks after that. So he's just getting his feet back under him this yeah. week. But yeah, we're, we're on track to, he's actually waiting on me, I think at this point to give him the capital projects I want to do, so. Good. Is yeah. Washington Electric made public a big request for a yeah they're going yeah. after a rate increase plus it took a shot at net metering in that same little magazine Could you believe that the whole newspaper was sort of taught yeah yeah yeah, yeah it, it it says uh mike will provide <laughs> it's uh uh sounds like a lyric to a song <laughs> Y'all ready for the financials? We are. Okay. Um, just a couple of little housekeeping things. The email I sent out today, did, when I first presented y'all this about a year ago, was it 
Um, we talked about having it done on a regular basis. So this is an update. And just to mention real quickly, what it shows is last year at this time, our arrears was 302,000 because at that time we weren't disconnecting people. We were still under the COVID restrictions. Now our total arrears is now 74,000. Yeah. So that has really come down a lot. Um, I'm, I'm making a concerted effort to really track our customers. Um, we do lots of calling and reminding and door knockers and all this kind of stuff. And I think it's really paying off. So just wanted to give you that quick update on that. Great. Another thing that was requested a couple months ago when I had asked for approval to do some write-offs, um, Lynn had asked for just an ongoing policy so y'all don't have to look at it every time and approve it. So that's what the memo is in here. And my recommendation was if a customer's electric account has a balance of 50 or less and they've been, been disconnected for more than four years that we just write it off. 50 <laughs> is a number that the PUC uses. They don't cut anybody Good. off for less than 50. They don't I allow it. us. I move to approve that. Yeah. Second. <laughs> Third. If you can't find them for four years, who's going to go after them? <laughs> exactly. Well, we do what we can in that four years. We don't just let it sit. Let me write that, make a note of that. Okay. Then, then there's just the financials. You'll see on the first page, I have a little section at the bottom about billing statistics. Um, other than that, the same, all the reports are the same. If y'all have any questions, I'll be happy to address them. Nothing really. Lee's question about our variance report. <laughs> All over the place. Which is that NAPA didn't have enough power for us last month, right? It was short. Correct. Because and we got to go out on the market and buy it at a higher price. Yeah. Now, if, That's correct. If, if they gave us what we needed, and, but we did what we, we contracted for, but we didn't need it, we'd still have to pay them for what we contracted for, right? Yes. So but then we could resell it. But then we could right. resell, resell it. But, but in this case, we, we're committed to give them the money. But in this case, they can't give us the power. Do they give us any remuneration or compensation for the fact that they didn't give us the power? No. So it's a one way street. They, they, Jesus. Okay. Yeah. And yeah. Michael, that's, it's that's it's the it's same as the, the deal we we're just signing up for now with this wind from New York. Yes, that's true. Yeah. Except that if they don't give us the power, we can cut back how much we pay them. They give us half the battery output. No, no, no. I mean, I mean the wind, the oh, Howard yes. wind, Hopkins, yeah. Harding yeah. wind, not Delorean. Howard, Howard. Yeah, yeah. Howard. Sorry. Wow, what a great business. Yeah. Plan. So, so Niagara, uh, that Niagara block is really fabulous. What it's there. I mean, it's cheapest power we get. It's even yeah. cheaper than Vulcan Hydro. But if it's not there, yeah, we have to suck it up. Please. Okay. But what's the analysis, Michael, on when it's not there? The water isn't running, it's the fall? No, the, the, the entire uh, Northeastern US is in a severe drought condition, uh, which has driven all the hydro generation I mean, some of the numbers that you see from BEPSA, if you see the really horrible numbers for Morrisville, is because they can't run any of their hydros. They don't have enough water. And the state, or the, yeah, the ANR put all those new restrictions on what they can and can't do with the water they do have. So there are, I think last month, they were over $500,000 over budget with purchase power for the year. That may happen in Lake Powell and Lake Mead out west. Oh, yeah. Sure. But we uh, need some rain. I have just a question on the just looking at the vendors. Um, some of the top vendors like uh, Twin State, Meridian, A and B, Blow and Coat. Yeah, they uh, especially Twin State that that looked like close to forty k for the month. I, I remember you saying there's some individual items that were either one time but uh, I, I was wondering if just to get an idea if we could get uh, 
uh, Beth, just a, like a list of top 10 vendors. I mean, I, I always found this useful in our business, just seeing what the biggest expenses were uh, for you know, non-discretion stuff, uh, like vendors like, like these, uh, and seeing whether or not you know, there are other vendors, uh, whether or not it's uh, uh, you go to a single vendor or you shop around, I'm sure you, you shop around, but uh, I guess it, I'm just, it just added up to a lot. It added up to like close to 100K for these, these individual vendors. Yeah, so Twin State Vents is our primary uh, equipment and materials provider. So they supply us anything from nuts and bolts on poles to a recloser, to a circuit breaker, to a group operated switch, anything we might need in the system. So yeah, they we get some pretty expensive bills from them and you know, that's, that's reality. We do um, cost check with another vendor called Wesco. So Wesco and Twin State uh, were the two, are the two historic providers in Vermont for the last 35 years I'm aware of. And Wesco used to be the cheaper of the two because CVPS was an Alliance customer of theirs and CVPS bought everything there. No matter what it was, it went through Wesco, which let them kind of offer everybody else better pricing as well. So everybody kind of followed the big buyer. Well, now the big buyer is GMP and CVPS in one as the new GMP, and they use Twin State. So the, kind of the same thing has happened. Twin State can offer a little bit better price because they do so much bulk. For example, I had to buy a circuit breaker for the Center Road Solar Project. For me to buy it on our own through Wesco was going to cost like $6,000 more than going through Twin State because they just sell so much more. Right. And, and Meridian is our uh, software provider. We have a contract with them. Right. Uh, it seemed like uh, there you have a contract, but there are one time a series of, of different charges. Uh, it wasn't like a one line item. Uh, I don't know if they charge uh, for different things I'd, I'd have to go we, through. We, well, they, we, can, they... we can split up their bill depending on what we're actually paying for okay so some of it goes for software some of it may go specifically specifically for a um interaction with uh internet online we will apply that to different accounts okay so we break it up to where it should apply to or a month so our month our monthly fee with them is about seven or seventy five hundred bucks a month and then there's other stuff so if Beth needs them to change the way rate one bills on this day or that day, and mm -hmm. they have to change a program, then that's a service they would charge us for. Right. So there are then, adders to yeah. the monthly fees. And then okay. there's certain software licenses that we have to pay once a year. Yeah. Got it. And uh, uh, you're pretty, we're pretty committed. <laughs> we're, we're, we chose them. Uh, after much consideration, but yes, we're stuck with them until we choose to go a different route another day, which I don't see happening anytime soon. In fact, I would say every other VEPSA member is drooling and wishes they had SEDC. <laughs> yeah, and, and changing vendors for, for something like this, it always, you know, it sounds like a good idea, but then it ends up being a- It's huge. Yeah. A transition is- so we, we were previously with an outfit um, company called Harris North Star Vents, and they had promised to automate the net metering for Hardwick Electric for like three years before I came. So I chased them for another year, and they finally said, well, we can't do it with your version of software, so you're going to have to pay $195,000 for a firmware revision, <clears throat> and then we can set up your program and be automated. And I then started looking at other, other providers and ended up signing an agreement with SCDC. And for $149,000, we got the whole system, our own servers in-house, uh, great service, everything automated, and see you later, Harris Northstar. And SCDC has now changed their name. They're Meridian. They're Meridian, yeah. And uh, it, just one more A and B uh, for. Um, That's our veg management contractor. They do all our trimming. Right. But they also, 
Adam, the owner, is also great with uh, big truck repairs and hydraulic systems. So if we end up blowing a hose on a truck, or you know, he usually the guy we call to fix that. So you see other bills from him as well. But normally you'll see maybe six to seven thousand a week for him for trimming services. Okay, so yeah, I mean it was adding up to a quarter million dollars a year or something yep. for trimming. Okay, that's which is a substantial percentage of yep. the budget. And then we turn some of his bills, we turn around and bill the cable company if they own a portion of it. He's an Agent Orange instead. We that'd be great. I don't <laughs> think the customers would appreciate it, but it would be an effective tool. <laughs> And it's amusing, Mike, that he fixes your trucks because his trucks look like hunks of junk. <laughs> they they aren't new, but they run great. And they're yeah, all good. tested. They're all tested and certified and good to go. So yeah, I see them parked on Route 15, of course, between here and Marsville all the time. Yeah. And there are just one more uh, series of refunds. Uh, I can't remember where it was, but they're... Uh, those, those are for projects that customers paid for and then decided not to do them. Okay. Or their project came in under budget. So we've said, oh, it's going to cost you 10,000. But then we started the work and found out, oh, we can do it this way. It's only going to cost you five. Then we reimburse them the five they already paid. All right. It, it just seemed like more this month than usual. Beth, can you look at your page 78? Okay. Under investments, that the the Velco stock, what sets the price of that stock that we, we carry there? Is that the going market right now, or is it? We get statements from Velco. I honestly, to be honest, I can I can find out what's driving that, but we use their statements. They give us a statement. On. Okay. There's well, just what they do. What they do is they'll say, we need to. Um, we need X number of dollars to do projects X, Y, and Z next year. So we're going to have a sale and they'll offer up shares of stock into that investment. And we buy into those. So it depends on what they're doing uh, in their coming year when they, when they mm -hmm. initiate a sale that determines the price. Have we seen that unit price move a lot each year or is it kind of pretty consistent? It doesn't change, does it? I'm oh, sorry. I'm not positive, Mike. I, beyond I that, know. beyond that, I'll have to big it up for you. Okay. And then under cash, you have GE fund checking, a little over four million dollars. What is that? <laughs> we, you actually have to combine that with the payroll account to get the true amount of cash we have available. It's just the way the accounting was set up that there's this cash fund, but then there's the payroll that's actually okay, so that from, that, that's cumulative from through the year. Year, that's cumulative to the end of August. That's not just for August. Correct. Okay, because this says it's the August balance sheet. Okay, got it. Cumulative. So we have two um, check series, Mike, that we process. One is for AP, and one is for payroll, and those are, those two numbers are from the two different series of checks. Yeah. But the I actual money's come from the same account. Okay. That's all I had for the questions. Anybody else? Any new business? Are we finished? Uh, oh. I can I can do a five minute or less executive session if you want it. If you'd like to. And that would be on a legal matter, the early disclosure of which would put Hardwick Electric at a disadvantage. So do we need a motion to enter? Uh, okay. That was the motion I seconded. <laughs> no, you have to make it because I can't make a motion. All right. Okay, we, we go into executive session to discuss a legal matter, the public disclosure of which we could jeopardize the discussions. And, and Perfect. 
Second. Okay, so let me pause this thing. 60 seconds right here. <laughs> yeah, we're still over two hours though, Michael. No, yeah, came out yeah. executive session with uh, no action taken. That's because Vince asked so many questions. <laughs> <laughs> uh, do we have a no, motion to adjourn? <laughs> yeah, a motion. Second. Anybody else want a second? <laughs> second. Motion carried. We are adjourned. Okay. Thank you all very much. Okay. Thank you guys. Take care.